chapter nine of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay chapter nine plans of campaign about the first of december eighteen sixty one mr lincoln who saw more clearly than mcclellan then general-in-chief the urgent necessity for some movement of the army suggested to him a plan of campaign which afterwards much debated and discussed and finally rejected is now seen to have been eminently wise and sagacious he made a brief autograph memorandum of his plan which he handed to mcclellan who kept it for ten days and returned it to mr lincoln with a hurried memorandum in pencil showing that it made little impression on his mind the memorandum and answer are so illustrative of the two men that we give them here in full copied from the original manuscript if it were determined to make a forward movement of the army of the potomac without awaiting further increase of numbers or better drill and discipline how long would it require to actually get in motion answer in pencil if bridge trains ready by december fifteenth probably twenty fifth after leaving all that would be necessary how many troops could join the movement from southwest of the river in pencil seventy one thousand how many from northeast of it in pencil thirty three thousand suppose then that of those southwest of the river in pencil fifty thousand move forward and menace the enemy at centreville the remainder of the movable force on that side move rapidly to the crossing of the ococquin by the road from alexandria towards richmond there to be joined by the whole movable force from northeast of the river having landed from the potomac just below the mouth of the ococquan moved by land up the south side of that stream to the crossing point named then the whole moved together by the road thence to brentville and beyond to the railroad just south of its crossing of broad run a strong detachment of cavalry having gone rapidly ahead to destroy the railroad bridges south and north of the point if the crossing of the ococquin by those from above be resisted those landing from the potomac below to take the resisting force of the enemy in rear or if the landing from the potomac be resisted those crossing the ococquin from above to take that resisting force in rear both points will probably not be successfully resisted at the same time the force in front of centreville if pressed too hardly should fight back slowly into the entrenchments behind them armed vessels and transportation should remain at the potomac landing to cover a possible retreat general mcclellan returned the memorandum with this reply i enclose the paper you left with me filled as you requested in arriving at the numbers given i have left the minimum number in garrison and observation information received recently leads me to believe that the enemy could meet us in front with equal forces nearly and i have now my mind actively turned towards another plan of campaign that i do not think at all anticipated by the enemy nor by many of our own people the general's information was as usual erroneous johnston reports his effective total at this time as about forty seven thousand men less than one-third what mcclellan imagined it lincoln however did not insist upon knowing what the general's other plan was nor did he press further upon his attention the suggestion that had been so scantily considered and so curtly dismissed but as the weeks went by in inaction his thoughts naturally dwelt upon the opportunities afforded by an attack on the enemy's right and the project took more and more definite shape in his mind congress convened on the second of december and one of its earliest subjects of discussion was the battle of ball's bluff 
roscoe conkling in the house of representatives and zachariah chandler in the senate brought forward resolutions for the appointment of committees to investigate and determine the responsibility for that disaster but on motion of grimes of iowa the senate chose to order a permanent joint committee of three senators and four representatives to inquire into the conduct of the war this action was unanimously agreed to by the house and the committee was appointed consisting of senators b f wade chandler and andrew johnson and of representatives gooch cavode julian and odell this committee known as the committee on the conduct of the war was for four years one of the most important agencies in the country it assumed and was sustained by congress in assuming a great range of prerogative it became a stern and zealous censor of both the army and the government it called soldiers and statesmen before it and questioned them like refractory schoolboys it claimed to speak for the loyal people of the united states and this claim generally met with the sympathy and support of a majority of the people's representatives in congress assembled it was often hasty and unjust in its judgments but always earnest patriotic and honest it was assailed with furious denunciation and defended with headlong and indiscriminating eulogy and on the whole it must be said to have merited more praise than blame even before this committee was appointed as we have seen senators chandler and wade representing the more ardent and eager spirits in congress had repeatedly pressed upon the government the necessity of employing the army of the potomac in active operations and now that they felt themselves formally entrusted with a mandate from the people to that effect were still more urgent and persistent general mcclellan and his immediate following treated the committee with something like contempt but the president with his larger comprehension of popular forces knew that he must take into account an agency of such importance and though he steadily defended general mcclellan and his deliberateness of preparation before the committee he constantly assured him in private that not a moment ought to be lost in getting himself in readiness for a forward movement a free people accustomed to considering public affairs as their own can stand reverses and disappointments they are capable of making great exertions and great sacrifices the one thing that they cannot endure is inaction on the part of their rulers the one thing that they insist upon is to see some result of their exertions and sacrifices december was the fifth month that general mcclellan had been in command of the greatest army ever brought together on this continent it was impossible to convince the country that a longer period of preparation was necessary before this army could be led against one inferior in numbers and not superior in discipline or equipment as a matter of fact the country did not believe the rebel army to be equal to the army of the union in any of these particulars it did not share the delusion of general mcclellan and his staff in regard to the numbers of his adversary and the common sense of the people was nearer right in its judgment than the computations of the general and his inefficient secret service mcclellan reported to the secretary of war that johnston's army at the end of october numbered one hundred and fifty thousand and that he would therefore require to make an advance movement with the army of the potomac a force of two hundred and forty thousand johnston's report of that date shows an effective total of forty one thousand men it was useless to try to convince general mcclellan of the impossibility of such a concentration of troops in front of him he simply added together the aggregates furnished by the guesses of his spies and implicitly believed the monstrous sum it is worthy of notice that the confederate general rarely fell into the corresponding error at the time that mcclellan was quadrupling in his imagination the rebel force 
johnston was estimating the army under mcclellan at exactly its real strength aware that his army was less than one-third as strong as the union forces johnston contented himself with neutralizing the army at washington passing the time in drilling and disciplining his troops who according to his own account were seriously in need of it he could not account for the inactivity of the union army military operations he says were practicable until the end of december but he was never molested our military exercises had never been interrupted no demonstrations were made by the troops of that army except the occasional driving in of a confederate cavalry picket by a large mixed force the federal cavalry rarely ventured beyond the protection of infantry and the ground between the two armies had been less free to it than to that of the confederate army there was at no time any serious thought of attacking the union forces in front of washington in the latter part of september september thirty general johnston had thought it possible for the richmond government to give him such additional troops as to enable him to take the offensive and jefferson davis had come to headquarters at fairfax court house to confer with the leading commanders on that subject at this conference held on the first of october it was taken for granted that no attack could be made with any chance of success upon the union army in its position before washington but it was thought that if enough force could be concentrated for the purpose the potomac might be crossed at the nearest ford maryland brought into rebellion and a battle delivered in the rear of washington where mcclellan would fight at a disadvantage mr davis asked the three generals present johnston beauregard and g w smith beginning with the last how many troops would be required for such a movement smith answered fifty thousand johnston and beauregard both said sixty thousand and all agreed that they would require a large increase of ammunition and means of transportation mr davis said it was impossible to reinforce them to that extent and the plan was dropped it is hard to believe that during this same month of october general mcclellan in a careful letter to the war department with an army according to his own account of one hundred and forty seven thousand six hundred and ninety five present for duty should have bewailed his numerical inferiority to the enemy and begged that all other departments should be stripped of their troops and stores to enable him to make a forward movement which he professed himself anxious to make not later than the twenty fifth of november if the government would give him men enough to meet the enemy on on equal terms this singular infatuation difficult to understand in a man of high intelligence and physically brave as mcclellan undoubtedly was must not be lost sight of it furnishes the sole explanation of many things otherwise inexplicable he rarely estimated the force immediately opposed to him at less than double its actual strength and in his correspondence with the government he persistently minimized his own force this rule he applied only to the enemy in his immediate vicinity he had no sympathy with commanders at a distance who asked for reinforcements when rosecrans succeeded him in western virginia and wanted additional troops general mcclellan was shocked at the unreasonable request when buell informed him that w t sherman insisted that two hundred thousand men were needed in the west he handed the letter to mr lincoln who was sitting in his headquarters at the moment with the remark the man is crazy every man sent to any other department he regarded as a sort of robbery of the army of the potomac all his demands were complied with to the full extent of the power of the government not only in a material but in a moral sense as well the president gave him everything that he could in addition to that mighty army he gave him his fullest confidence and support all through the autumn he stood by him 
urging him in private to lose no time but defending him in public against the popular impatience and when winter came on and the voice of congress nearly unanimous in demanding active operations added its authoritative tones to the clamor of the country the president endangered his own popularity by insisting that the general should be allowed to take his time for an advance in the latter part of december mcclellan as already stated fell seriously ill and the enforced paralysis of the army that resulted from this illness and lasted several weeks added a keener edge to the public anxiety the president painfully appreciated how much of justice there was in the general criticism which he was doing all that he could to allay he gave himself night and day to the study of the military situation he read a large number of strategical works he pored over the reports from the various departments and districts of the field of war he held long conferences with eminent generals and admirals and astonished them by the extent of his special knowledge and the keen intelligence of his questions he at last convinced himself that there was no necessity for any further delay that the army of the potomac was as nearly ready as it ever would be to take the field against the enemy and feeling that he could not wait any longer on the tenth of january after calling at general mcclellan's house and learning that the general was unable to see him he sent for generals mcdowell and franklin wishing to take counsel with them in regard to the possibility of beginning active operations with the army before washington general mcdowell has preserved an accurate report of this conference the president said that he was in great distress to use his own expression if something were not soon done the bottom would be out of the whole affair and if general mcclellan did not want to use the army he would like to borrow it provided he could see how it could be made to do something in answer to a direct question put by the president to general mcdowell that accomplished soldier gave a frank and straightforward expression of his conviction that by an energetic movement upon both flanks of the enemy a movement rendered entirely practicable by the superior numbers of the union army he could be forced from his works and compelled to accept battle on terms favorable to us general franklin rather favored an attack upon richmond by way of york river a question arising as to the possibility of obtaining the necessary transportation the president directed both generals to return the next evening and in the meantime to inform themselves thoroughly as to the matter in question they spent the following day in this duty and went the next evening to the executive mansion with what information they had been able to procure and submitted a paper in which they both agreed that in view of the time and means required to take the army to a distant base operations could now best be undertaken from the present base substantially as proposed by mcdowell the secretaries of state and of the treasury who were present coincided in this view and the postmaster-general mr blair alone opposed it they separated to meet the next day at three o'clock general meigs having been called into conference concurred in the opinion that a movement from the present base was preferable but no definite resolution was taken as general mcclellan was reported as fully recovered from his illness and another meeting was arranged for monday the thirteenth at the white house where the three members of the cabinet already mentioned with mcdowell franklin meigs and general mcclellan himself were present at the request of the president mcdowell made a statement of what he and franklin had done under mr lincoln's orders and gave his reasons for advising a movement to the front he spoke with great courtesy and deference towards his superior officer and made an apology for the position in which he stood mcclellan was not inclined to relieve the situation of any awkwardness there might be in it he merely said coldly if not curtly 
to mcdowell you are entitled to have any opinion you please and made no further remark or comment the president spoke somewhat at length on the matter and general mcclellan said very briefly that the case was so clear a blind man could see it and went off instinctively upon the inadequacy of his forces the secretary of the treasury whose sympathies were with that section of his party which had already lost all confidence in general mcclellan asked him point-blank what he intended to do with the army and when he intended doing it a long silence ensued even if the question had been a proper one it is doubtful whether general mcclellan would have answered it under the circumstances it must have required some self-control for him to have contented himself with merely evading it he said that buell in kentucky must move first and then refused to answer the question unless ordered to do so the president asked him if he counted upon any particular time not asking what the time was but had he in his own mind any particular time fixed when a movement could be begun this question was evidently put as affording a means of closing a conference which was becoming disagreeable if not dangerous mcclellan promptly answered in the affirmative and the president rejoined then i will adjourn this meeting it is a remarkable fact that although the plan recommended by these generals was exactly the plan suggested six weeks before by the president to mcclellan neither of them made the slightest reference to that incident that mr lincoln did not refer to a matter so close to his heart is a striking instance of his reticence and his magnanimity that general mcclellan never mentioned it would seem to show that he thought so little of the matter as to have forgotten it he seemed also to have thought little of this conference he makes no reference to it in his report he says referring to this period about the middle of january eighteen sixty two upon recovering from a severe illness i found that excessive anxiety for an immediate movement of the army of the potomac had taken possession of the minds of the administration the last words of the phrase refer not only to the president but to mr stanton the new secretary of war who began as soon as he took charge of his department to ply the commander of the army with continual incitements to activity all suggestions of this sort whether coming from the government congress or the press general mcclellan received with surprise and displeasure and the resentment and vexation of his immediate friends and associates found vent in expressions of contempt for unmilitary critics which being reported only increased the evil that provoked them he at last laid before the president his plan for attacking richmond by the lower chesapeake which the president disapproved having previously convinced himself of the superior merit of the plan for a direct movement agreed upon by generals mcdowell franklin and meigs who were ignorant of the fact that it was his further delay ensued the president not being willing to accept a plan condemned by his own judgment and by the best professional opinion that he could obtain and general mcclellan being equally reluctant to adopt a plan that was not his own the president at last at the end of his patience convinced that nothing would be done unless he intervened by a positive command issued on the twenty seventh of january his general war order number one he wrote it without consultation with any one and read it to the cabinet not for their sanction but for their information the order directed that the twenty second day of february eighteen sixty two be the day for a general movement of the land and naval forces of the united states against the insurgent forces that especially the army at and about fortress monroe the army of the potomac the army of western virginia the army near mumfordville kentucky the army and flotilla at cairo and a naval force in the gulf of mexico be ready to move on that day that all other forces both land and naval with their respective commanders 
obey existing orders for the time and be ready to obey additional orders when duly given that the heads of departments and especially the secretaries of war and of the navy with all their subordinates and the general-in-chief with all other commanders and subordinates of land and naval forces will severally be held to their strict and full responsibilities for prompt execution of this order four days later as a necessary result of this general summons to action a special instruction called president's special war order number no. one was issued to general mcclellan commanding that all the disposable force of the army of the potomac after providing safely for the defense of washington be formed into an expedition for the immediate object of seizing and occupying a point upon the railroad southwestward of what is known as manassas junction all details to be in the discretion of the commander-in-chief and the expedition to move before or on the twenty-second day of february next this is the president's suggestion of december one put at last in the form of a command it would not have been characteristic of general mcclellan to accept such an order as final nor of mr lincoln to refuse to listen to his objections and to a full statement of his own views the president even went so far as to give him in the following note dated february three a schedule of points on which he might base his objections and develop his views my dear sir you and i have distinct and different plans for a movement of the army of the potomac yours to be down the chesapeake up the rappahannock to urbana and across land to the terminus of the railroad on the york river mine to move directly to a point on the railroad southwest of manassas if you will give me satisfactory answers to the following questions i shall gladly yield my plan to yours first does not your plan involve a greatly larger expenditure of time and money than mine second wherein is a victory more certain by your plan than mine third wherein is a victory more valuable by your plan than mine fourth in fact would it not be less valuable in this that it would break no great line of the enemy's communications while mine would fifth in case of disaster would not a retreat be more difficult by your plan than mine this elicited from general mcclellan a long letter dated the same day in which he dwelt with great emphasis on all the possible objections that could lie against a direct movement from washington and insisted with equal energy upon the advantages of a campaign by the lower chesapeake he rejects without argument the suggestion of an attack on both flanks of the enemy on the ground of insufficient force a ground that we have seen to be visionary he says that an attack on the left flank of the enemy is impracticable on account of the length of the line and confines his statement to a detail of the dangers and difficulties of an attack on the confederate right by the line of the Okokwan he insists that he will be met at every point by a determined resistance to use his own words he brings out in bold relief the great advantage possessed by the enemy in the strong central position he occupies with roads diverging in every direction and a strong line of defence enabling him to remain on the defensive with a small force on one flank while he concentrates everything on the other for a decisive action even if he succeeded in such a movement he thought little of its results they would be merely the possession of the field of battle the evacuation of the line of the upper potomac by the enemy and the moral effect of the victory they would not end the war the result he seemed to propose to himself in the one decisive battle he expected to fight somewhere 
turning to his own plan he hoped by moving from his new base on the lower chesapeake to accomplish this enormous and final success to force the enemy either to beat us in a position selected by ourselves disperse or pass beneath the caudine forks the point which he thought promised the most brilliant results was urbana on the lower rappahannock but one march from west point on the york river at the junction of the pamunkey and mattapony the key of that region and thence but two marches to richmond he enjoys the prospect of brilliant and rapid movements by which the rebel armies shall be cut off in detail richmond taken and the rebellion brought to a close he says finally my judgment as a general is clearly in favor of this project so much am i in favor of the southern line of operation that i would prefer the move from fortress monroe as a base as a certain though less brilliant movement than that from urbana to an attack upon manassas most of the assumptions upon which this letter was based have since proved erroneous the force which mcclellan ascribed to johnston existed only in his imagination and in the wild stories of his spies his force was about three times that of johnston and was therefore not insufficient for an attack upon one flank of the enemy while the other was held in check it is now clearly known that the determined resistance that he counted upon if he should attack by the line of the ococquan would not have been made general johnston says that about the middle of february he was sent for in great haste to richmond and on arriving there was told by jefferson davis that the government thought of withdrawing the army to a less exposed position johnston replied that the withdrawal of the army from centreville would be necessary before mcclellan's invasion which was to be looked for as soon as the roads were practicable but thought that it might be postponed for the present he left richmond however with the understanding on his part that the army was to fall back as soon as practicable and the moment he returned to his camp he began his preparations to retire at once from a position which both he and the richmond government considered absolutely untenable on the twenty second of february johnston says orders were given to the chiefs of the quartermasters and subsistence departments to remove the military property in the depots at manassas junction and its dependencies to gordonsville as quickly as possible the railroads were urged to work to their utmost capacity the line of the Oconquan against which mcclellan was arguing so strenuously to the president was substantially the route by which johnston expected him believing like the thorough soldier that he was that it would be taken because invasion by that route would be the most difficult to meet and knowing that he could not cope with the federal army north of the rappahannock he was ready to retire behind that stream at the first news of mcclellan's advance everything now indicates that if mcclellan had chosen to obey the president's order and to move upon the enemy in his front in the latter part of february or the first days of march one of the cheapest victories ever gained by a fortunate general awaited him he would have struck an enemy greatly inferior in strength equipment and discipline in the midst of a difficult retreat already begun encumbered by a vast accumulation of provisions and stores which would have become the prize of the victor he would not have won the battle that was to end the war that sole battle was a dream of youth and ambition the war was not of a size to be finished by one fight but he would have gained at slight cost what would have been in reality a substantial success and would have appeared in its effect upon public opinion and the morale of the army an achievement of great importance the enemy instead of quietly retiring at his own time would have seemed to be driven beyond the rapidan the clearing the potomac of hostile camps and batteries above and below washington and the capture of millions of pounds of stores would have afforded a relief to the anxious public mind that the national cause sorely needed at that time and which general mcclellan needed most of all <laughs> 
these facts that are now so clear to every one were not so evident then and although the president and the leading men in the government and in congress were strongly of the opinion that the plan favored by mr lincoln and approved by mcdowell meigs and franklin was the right one it was a question of the utmost gravity whether he should force the general-in-chief to adopt it against his obstinate protest it would be too much to ask that any government should assume such a responsibility and risk on the other hand the removal of the general from the command of the army of the potomac would have been a measure not less serious there was no successor ready who was his equal in accomplishments in executive efficiency or in popularity among the soldiers besides this and in spite of his exasperating slowness the president still entertained for him a strong feeling of personal regard he therefore after much deliberation and deep distress of mind yielded his convictions gave up his plan and adopted that of general mcclellan for a movement by the lower chesapeake he never took a resolution which cost him more in his own feelings and in the estimation of his supporters in congress and in the country at large he made no explanation of the reasons that induced this resolution he thought it better to suffer any misrepresentation rather than to communicate his own grave misgivings to the country the committee on the conduct of the war who were profoundly grieved and displeased by this decision made only this grim reference to it your committee have no evidence either oral or documentary of the discussions that ensued or of the arguments that were submitted to the consideration of the president that led him to relinquish his own line of operations and consent to the one proposed by general mcclellan except the result of a council of war held in february eighteen sixty two this council which the committee say was the first ever called by mcclellan and then only at the direction of the president was composed of twelve general officers mcdowell sumner heitzelman bernard keyes fitzjohn porter franklin w f smith mccall blenker andrew porter and nagley of hooker's division the first four voted against the urbana plan keyes only favored it on condition that the potomac batteries should first be reduced the rest voted for it without conditions this was the council afterwards referred to by stanton when he said we saw ten generals afraid to fight this plan of campaign having been definitely adopted mr lincoln urged it forward as eagerly as if it had been his own john tucker one of the assistant secretaries of war was charged by the president and mr stanton with the entire task of transporting the army of the potomac to its new base and the utmost diligence was enjoined upon him quartermasters rufus ingalls and henry c hodges were assigned to assist him we shall see that tucker performed the prodigious task entrusted to him in a manner not excelled by any similar feat in the annals of the world but meanwhile there were two things that the president was anxious to have done and general mcclellan undertook them one was to reopen the line of the baltimore and ohio railroad the other to clear out the rebel batteries that still obstructed the navigation of the potomac for the first extensive preparations were made a large body of troops was collected at harper's ferry canal boats were brought there in sufficient quantity to make a permanent bridge general mcclellan went to the place and finding everything satisfactory for the operation telegraphed for a large additional force of cavalry artillery and a division of infantry to rendezvous at once at harper's ferry to cross as soon as the bridge was completed which would be only the work of a day and then to push on to winchester and strasburg it was only on the morning of the next day when the attempt was made to pass the canal boats through the lift lock that it was discovered they were some six inches too wide to go through the general thus found that his permanent bridge so long planned and from which so much had been expected was impossible 
he countermanded his order for the troops contented himself with a reconnaissance to charlestown and martinsburg and returned to washington as he says well satisfied with what had been accomplished he was much surprised at finding that his satisfaction was not shared by the president mr lincoln's slow anger was thoroughly roused by this ridiculous outcome of an important enterprise and he received the general on his return in a manner that somewhat disturbed his complacency mcclellan went on in his leisurely way preparing for a movement upon the batteries near the oconquin undisturbed by the increasing signs of electric perturbation at the executive mansion and the capitol which answered but faintly to the growing excitement in the north the accumulating hostility and distrust of general mcclellan totally unjust as it affected his loyalty and honor and his ardent desire to serve his country in the way that he thought best though almost entirely unknown to him was poured upon the president the heads of government and the leading members of congress in letters and conversations and newspaper leaders mr lincoln felt the injustice of much of this criticism but he also felt powerless to meet it unless some measures were adopted to force the general into an activity which was as necessary to his own reputation as to the national cause the twenty second of february came and passed and the president's order to move on that day was not obeyed mcclellan's inertia prevailed over the president's anxious eagerness on the eighth of march mr lincoln issued two more important general orders the first directed general mcclellan to divide the army of the potomac into four army corps to be commanded respectively by generals irvin mcdowell e v sumner s p heitzelman and e d keyes the forces to be left in front of washington were to be placed in command of general james s wadsworth a fifth corps was to be formed to be commanded by general n p banks for months this measure had been pressed upon general mcclellan by the government an army of a hundred and fifty thousand men it was admitted could not be adequately commanded by the machinery of divisions and brigades alone but though mcclellan accepted this view in principle he could not be brought to put it into practice he said that he would prefer to command the army personally on its first campaign and then select the corps commanders for their behavior in the field the government thought better to make the organization at once giving the command of corps to the ranking division commanders the fact that of the four generals chosen three had been in favor of an immediate movement against the enemy in front of washington will of course be considered as possessing a certain significance it was usually regarded as a grievance by the partisans of general mcclellan the other order is of such importance that we give it entire president's general war order number three executive mansion washington march eighth eighteen sixty two ordered that no change of the base of operations of the army of the potomac shall be made without leaving in and about washington such a force as in the opinion of the general-in-chief and the commanders of army corps shall leave said city entirely secure that no more than two army corps about fifty thousand troops of said army of the potomac shall be moved en route for a new base of operations until the navigation of the potomac from washington to the chesapeake bay shall be freed from enemy's batteries and other obstructions or until the president shall hereafter give express permission that any movement as aforesaid en route for a new base of operations which may be ordered by the general-in-chief and which may be intended to move upon the chesapeake bay shall begin to move upon the bay as early as the eighteenth of march instant and the general-in-chief shall be responsible that it moves as early as that day ordered that the army and navy cooperate in an immediate effort to capture the enemy's batteries upon the potomac between washington and the chesapeake bay abraham lincoln l thomas adjutant-general 
this order has always been subject to the severest criticism from general mcclellan's partisans but if we admit that it was proper for the president to issue any order at all there can be no valid objection made to the substance of this one it was indispensable that washington should be left secure it would have been madness to allow general mcclellan to take all the troops to the peninsula leaving the potomac obstructed by the enemy's batteries so near the capital and the fixing of a date beyond which the beginning of the movement should not be postponed had been shown to be necessary by the exasperating experience of the past eight months the criticism so often made that a general who required to have such orders as these given him should have been dismissed the service is the most difficult of all to meet nobody felt so deeply as mr lincoln the terrible embarrassment of having a general in command of that magnificent army who was absolutely without initiative who answered every suggestion of advance with demands for reinforcements who met entreaties and reproaches with unending arguments to show the superiority of the enemy and the insufficiency of his own resources and who yet possessed in an eminent degree the enthusiastic devotion of his friends and the general confidence of the rank and file there was so much of executive efficiency and ability about him that the president kept on hoping to the last that if he could once get him started he would then handle the army well and do great things with it End of chapter nine